Okay. All right, everyone, thank you for uh, attending our third prospective um, unicorn seminar. Um, I'm very happy to say that we're joined today by Professor Jack Harris, uh, all the way from, from uh, America, Yale University. Um, and before we get to our speaker, let me just make a few quick announcements, which I'm sure you've already heard of, that there's a, um, an excellent nanomechanics online um, mini workshop happening. Uh, so it's today and tomorrow. So don't go there right now. Go there after this talk. <laughs> um, but there is, I think, ha happening tomorrow as well. There's some events there. And so you're most welcome to catch up with that. Um, just as a final reminder also for next week, we have uh, Yu Ma, who will be talking from Imperial College um, for of our Frontis um, seminars. And as always, simple house rules, uh, of course, without saying, be respectful. Please turn off your mic and close your video if you're joining us on Zoom. The Q&A, as always, will be uh, at the end. Um, and if you want to ask your question directly, of course, you're most welcome to uh, by just raising your hand or typing in the Zoom chat. Those that are joining us through live chat at YouTube, um, please also put in your question and um, myself or Sophia will pass that over to Andreas to, to ask the chat. Um, so without further ado, let me pass it over to Andreas, who will be chairing today's talk. Um, to take over and, um, and uh, enjoy. Thank you very much. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so for those who don't know me, I'm Andreas Nunkamp. I'm a Royal Society University Research Fellow over at the University of Nottingham. And I have the pleasure of chairing today's uh, perspective talk. So um, it is my pleasure to welcome Professor Jack Harris. Um, Jack is a professor at uh, Hijack uh, uh, of Physics and Applied Physics uh, at Yale University uh, in New Haven. Uh, he's also a member of the Yale uh, Quantum Institute. Um, he did his undergrad at Cornell, then moved for his PhD over to the other side uh, on uh, UC um, Santa Barbara, where he worked with David Ashelon. Um, then moved back to the other uh, coast again, to the East Coast uh, to work uh, at Harvard and MIT uh, at the Center of Ultracold Atoms, uh, where he worked with John uh, Doyle and Wolfgang Ketteli. And um, in uh, 2004, he uh, joined the faculty at Yale, where he has been ever since. Um, his group, is, uh, you, you of course know, um, has worked a lot on various approaches uh, in the field of um, optical mechanics, um, pioneered the um, um, ANSATS, the, uh, the um, device member in the middle, and more recently uh, has um, worked on combining high finesse cavities with uh, superfluid helium. Uh, Jack, thank you very much for taking the time to give one of your perspective talks here. And that's much appreciated. And we're looking very much forward to what you have to tell us. Thank so, you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here to talk to you all anyway. Um, so as we uh, announced, there's a little bit of a short, um, you know, five to 10 minutes in the beginning here where we can um, find out a bit more for you personally, maybe. And uh, let, so let me start by, um, by asking you um, um, that um, uh, how things basically started, you know, uh, when uh, you started working optical mechanics, you know, you, when you became an assistant professor over at Yale, at that time, <coughs> you know, the field was still in infancy and there was not many other groups working on this. Um, so maybe can we try to understand a bit uh, what influenced you in making that, uh, you know, um, um, decision to work on such a project, you know, were there certain people or certain papers that talk or something which influenced you getting into that kind of ideas? Yeah, it was, uh, it's a little bit of a complicated story and I would correct you a tiny bit, like opt quantum optical mechanics was not in its infancy when I started, it was, you know, almost a hundred years old. Uh, I would really say quantum optical mechanics starts with this 1909 paper by Albert Einstein that I'll mention in the beginning of my talk. Uh, and it, you know, when him, Bohr, uh, Schrodinger, Sommerfeld were all discussing this gravitational wave, people picked it up and relearned it in a different context. Uh, so it had kind of a philosophical beginning in the aughts and teens and twenties and thirties. It had a practical, uh, you know, life starting in the sixties, seventies, and eighties with people like Vladimir Vygotsky and Carl Caves and Kip Thorne, uh, Harry Khalili. Um, 
And then, as you say, sort of in the early 2000s, it began to make contact with the micro NEMS, microfab world, which offered some new tools uh, and electromechanics and superconducting qubits. So that's kind of a big arc of the field. And I was at some point a graduate student off somewhere, and my advisor had asked me to build uh, basically very sensitive micromechanical device to do magnetometry, to measure magnetic samples. And eventually we got this working and we could make little gallium arsenide cantilevers and we could measure its position just with a very crude fiber optic interferometer. The crudest thing uh, an unexperienced early year graduate student might kind of slap together in order to study the magnetism, like no interest in interferometry or quantum optics. Um, and while I was doing those measurements, like I was wondering, you know, at some level, light is bouncing off of this thing. And I know that that's radiation pressure. And I know that somehow light is made of photons. And so there must be like some sort of bouncy collision-y thing going on. Uh, but this may come as a surprise to you. In Santa Barbara in the year 1996, there was no quantum optics, or very little. And what there was, I wasn't in touch with. So I just didn't even know what questions to ask. I'd never heard of the standard quantum limit. I didn't know how you told any of these stories. But it seemed like kind of a potentially curious thing. It would be fun to think about it, but I had no idea how to frame questions. Um, and then I went and did a postdoc in ultra cold atoms, a real uh, change in field, because that seemed very exciting. And indeed it was in the late 90s, early 2000s. And while I was at the Harvard MIT Center for Ultra Cold Atoms, not thinking about quantum optics at all, not thinking about quantum information, but there was like a, a community. And so I was going to the seminar series and every once in a while there'd be someone who like seemed to know about this you know, quantum measurement back action stuff. And this seemed like, oh, maybe there are people thinking about this. And then uh, for me, a few things happened. I started to realize that there was this gravitational wave community who had worked out all this stuff in great detail. I wasn't yet in a position to understand it. Oh, well, oh, at MIT, you have that, uh, you had that as well. I, I know, but like... boy, you know, that's a, that's very few miles in real space and it can be a lot of miles in professional space. Um, and, uh, and I think like the thing that made me try to take this seriously was this paper from Dirk Baumeister in 2003, um, which, you know, sort of looked at this question again, that had been looked at by Bosa and Knight before, but, you know, and in all honesty, by uh, Einstein, Schrodinger, and Sommerfeld in the 1930s, which is, hey, if you have a mirror and a photon bounces off it, you're talking about entanglement. Um, and then I, that sort of spurred me on a little bit. And then I got better at finding the actual literature that I could understand. I got better at finding the people at MIT, Nurgis Mahalala. Uh, she was an assistant professor. I called her up as a random postdoc with dumb questions. She spent a day walking me through her lab and talking me through this stuff. Misha Lukin, likewise, was a brand new assistant professor. I went to him with this question about like, how does this shot noise thing work? And, you know, he spent the better part of an afternoon talking. So I had some really generous uh, people who were willing to help me across a couple, a couple little gaps. But nonetheless, if you then started the, ex you know, your group, uh, didn't it feel like a, um, quite a big risk to, to do that? No, it felt like this is like the prime opportunity because like, Yes, there was this well-developed gravitational wave uh, part of the field. There was this well-developed straight quantum optics part of the field. There were, um, you know, people were thinking about doing superconducting qubit type of electromechanical. There are all these people who I began to realize were like laying or relaying the groundwork and not talking to each other uh, yet very much. And so it seemed like this fantastic time to like try to help knit things together and that it was ready to blossom. Um, and I thought the one thing that I could bring at that time was my experience with 3.5 micromachining. Like I learned to make some unusual 3.5 micromechanical devices, ga gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide. Um, and I thought this was going to be a way to really solve some of these technical problems of putting a really good mirror on a really good mechanical oscillator. Hmm. And in the end, that didn't turn out to be the right uh, approach for us, for our group. We did other things, but that's that gave me the confidence that I had a technical path forward. And then it just felt like around the periphery, there were like all these things just waiting for connections to be made and that that would be an exciting uh, process to be part of. Mm. So if I may ask, did you, did you have a plan B uh, if it uh, didn't work out? Yeah, so plan B was to use these very good uh, micromechanical magnetometers to measure the persistent current in normal metal rings. Mm. And in all honesty, that did happen. Uh, 
we had some nice papers on that. Um, loosely speaking, so we had some nice early results in optomechanics, and then the experiments got very hard. We had to, uh, so really what happened is we uh, published the membrane in the middle approach to optomechanics, and that is an interesting story. So that, uh, the reason that like we did not end up going into the clean room and building difficult gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide devices and working with a Fabry Perot cavity with a movable end mirror. The reason is that as an undergraduate, I mean, as a graduate student, uh, two things happened to me. One is that I went to a talk on a dark matter experiment called ADMX, where people are looking for axions uh, that uh, get produced in a big copper cavity as a microwave photon. And they want to tune this microwave cavity over lots of different frequencies. And for some reason that I still don't understand, they want to do this by moving a Teflon bar around inside the cavity. Okay. And if you do that, that changes the cavity's uh, resonant frequencies. And it's a sort of weird but legitimate way of tuning a cavity. And somehow it just stuck in my head that if you have an electromagnetic cavity and you have a dielectric in it, and that dielectric moves around, it will detune the cavity, maybe in some unpredictable but potentially useful way. And as we were having a harder and harder time aligning a Fabry-Pro cavity with a tiny movable mirror on a cantilever, and I was like, what is the better way to do this? Um, it occurred to me that like, all you really need is a cavity that is detuned by the displacement of anything. So why not just make your cavity, put your dielectric thing in the middle? Um, so thank you, dark matter axion searches. Um, and then the other thing that had happened is as a graduate student, um, I found uh, the early process of learning microfab kind of hard. And I remember at one point I was waiting for some chamber to pump down to vacuum and I was just thumbing through a catalog of uh, clean room supplies. And I came across what every electron microscopist knows, which is uh, silicon nitride membranes that are used to support samples. They're transparent to electron beams. So if you want to look through a sample with a TEM, this is a great way to do it. Now, this was so upsetting. I was so bummed. I was like, how come I can't make little gallium arsenide cantilevers, but there are companies that are just cranking out these wonderful freestanding silicon nitride membranes. They're a millimeter by a millimeter. They're only 50 nanometers thick. That's incredible. And here I am stuck, you know, trying to do my little project. Um, and so years later, when I was trying to think of something to put inside of a Fabry Pro cavity, I thought, oh, we'll just get some nice big AFM cantilevers but you couldn't actually buy AFM cantilevers that were big enough. They were all smaller than the waist of our Fabry Pro cavity that we happened to have at the time. And that seemed messy. But I remembered, oh, there are these, you know, silicon nitride membranes, you can just order them. They're a millimeter, that's big enough. Let's buy those and stick them in our cavity. Um, so that was plan A and it worked pretty well. Uh, but when it came time to work, get it working inside of a cryostat, that was a lot of years of frustrating, confusing, uh, difficult stuff. And so in that time, fortunately, plan B, which was running in parallel, came through, which was the persistent current measurements. So now, nowadays you, you run both parts. We're going to hear mostly about the, uh, the optimal no, mechanic? Uh, the persistent current experiment, those we've closed down. Um, All right, okay. you know, we, we got some nice results. Um, loosely speaking, I think that's how I got tenure. I mean, right. the optimal mechanic stuff had really kind of stalled out for a while. Um, uh, but those are challenging experiments and it was clear that to take the next step, I mean, I won't go into the detail of this mesoscopic electronic physics, but to take the next step and look at kind of the next level of interesting physics, that was going to be a real experimental challenge, even with the new techniques we brought and the level of interest in the field, the kind of funding that I could attract the number of students and postdocs who are interested in it, uh, were pushing one way. And at the same time, the optomechanics, we suddenly learned about superfluid helium and we learned about topological dynamics and uh, the cryogenic membrane in the middle setup was working well. And so it kind of, there was a squeezing out effect, I guess. Fair enough. So I think it's about time to get over to the talk. So um, if you are joining us now, then let me reintroduce our speaker uh, to you. Um, uh, today we have, uh, uh, we welcome Jack Harris, who is a professor at, at Yale University, and he will talk today about single phonon quantum uh, acoustics with superfluid helium. We're very much looking forward to your talk, Jack, and um, the space is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll share my screen and uh, let me know if this, if you see what seems to be a PowerPoint slide. Yep. 
that looks okay. good for me. That's a good sign. Okay, so first of all, uh, thank you uh, to the folks at Borden for the invitation to be here. I'm sad not to have a chance to visit the UK. That's always a real treat, but uh, it's great. Just everything being what it is to have a chance to chat with you and tell you about our, our, uh, our work. So the title of my talk is Single Phone on Quantum Acoustics with Superfluid Helium. And really what that means is we are one of the groups that are trying to take uh, quantum optomechanics to a place that quantum optics has been for decades, which is the place where you can really imagine experiments in which you have a reliable detector that goes click when a quantum reaches it. What we think of as a photomultiplier tube or a single photon detector. We'd like something equivalent in the acoustic domain or in the mechanical domain, something that really goes click when one phonon and exactly one phonon arrives and is quiet when no phonon has arrived. That gives you a lot of powerful tools if you think about a lot of the most interesting and dramatic tests of quantum mechanics. Um, a lot of them hinge on having this kind of technology. Um, and so they're mostly performed with light. We'd like to get to the point where we're doing those kinds of measurements with uh, mechanical degrees of freedom. So that's what this means. Um, in terms of questions through the talk, uh, Mudassar or Andreas, will you let me know when there are hands, or should I be keeping an eye on that? No, I'll be uh, looking at the, whether there are hands or not. Okay, so well, you, uh, I'll just leave it to your judgment when you want to interrupt me, but I'm very happy to take questions uh, at any time. So I'll talk about uh, a little bit more about what I was saying about where our goals in quantum optomechanics are. I'll talk about why superfluid helium is a really exciting material for pursuing those goals. I'll talk about uh, single photon detectors and how we sort of use them, trick them into being single phonon detectors. Um, <clears throat> I'll talk about what kind of measurements we've done so far with the devices we've built, and then our next steps, where we're headed in the future. So this is a group photo. It's a little bit out of date, but all the folks who worked on this project are here. Uh, Yi Chi Wang, Lucy Yu, Sean Frazier are all grad students, uh, but really Yogesh Patil is the postdoc who's led this project in pretty much every respect. And I also have to acknowledge uh, Jacob Reichel's group, uh, whose group helps us build the kinds of cavities that I'll tell you about in a minute. Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about this uh, with Andreas, but uh, one of the reasons that I like quantum optomechanics is that it takes um, like the most intangible aspects of our experience, which is light, this thing that, you know, define so much of our world, but we can never touch or feel or hold. And then it takes the most tangible aspects of our experiments, which are real objects we can touch and hold, uh, and it merges them together. And it, in doing so, it gives us at least the hope that quantum mechanics, this sort of mysterious uh, remote idea, can also be transferred into the world of tangible objects. So I find that really kind of inspiring and fun way uh, to think about science. Um, and even though quantum optomechanics in terms of, you know, micromechanical this and that and superconducting qubits is, you know, a development of the last couple of decades. This is a field that I would say is <clears throat> kind of exactly as old as quantum mechanics itself. So in 1909, um, Planck had published his paper five years, four or five years before, and I think it was largely regarded as a mathematical curiosity, including by Planck. But the game change, as I understand this history, is in 1909 when Einstein says, look, if that's the spectrum, we can use standard STAT-MEC to calculate the fluctuations of the black body light. And specifically, he calculates the fluctuating force. This is the variance of the radiation pressure of a black body source on a mirror, assuming that the spectrum is given by Planck's sort of mathematical guess. And what he finds is that it boils down into two terms. One is a fluctuating force just due to the thermal population of a bunch of classical modes. Uh, and then the other is this force here, which he points out you can interpret as the random collisions with the walls, with the mirror of individual particles, each having momentum HK. I guess maybe it should be an H bar K. Uh, so this is like, oh, really? Photons are tangible particles in this distinctly measurable sense? This paper, by the way, is amazing. This is like one small result. Um, when I finally read this paper, it totally made the hair on the back of my neck go up because he foresees uh, an astonishing chunk of what we would now call quantum electrodynamics uh, in 1909. So in 1927, uh, 
photon, single photon radiation pressure shows up again when Einstein and Bohr are debating interference and which path measurements. And now, you know, we would say that they kind of understood that if you have a slit that can recoil when a photon goes through it and thereby tell you which path the photon really took, you have entangled that photon with the motion of the slit. They didn't use those words. Those words really started to get formulated a couple years later, again with Einstein, now with Schrodinger and Sommerfeld. And this is a letter <coughs> from Schrodinger to Sommerfeld in which he points out that if you take a photon and you bounce it off a mirror, then uh, the quantum description of this system afterwards has their momentum in what we would now call an entangled state. So this is all bread and butter quantum optomechanics. I mean, this is uh, really the kind of things that we try to realize in the lab now. This was very much in the domain of philosophy and foundations of physics. Um, I think until it came time to really make serious designs for gravitational wave detectors. Um, and then the field of quantum optomechanics began to look a bit more the way it does now. And then in the subsequent decades, it made some contributions to, but really benefited greatly from the fields of ultra cold atoms, quantum information physics generally, and the continuing push to build precision instruments for testing the standard model. Uh, so that's maybe one way of looking at the history of quantum optomechanics. In the present day, um, I think this work has three very distinct motivations, which is really good. I think it's good to have a diversity of motivations depending on what you're frustrated about on a given day. Maybe it gives you a chance to think about something else. I mean, I would say a totally legitimate motivation for this field is just gee whiz. I mean, I think it's amazing that Marcus Arndt can take a molecule that looks like this and launch it down meters of vacuum chamber, aim it so that it passes through real physical slits, actual holes in a screen, collect those molecules one by one on a phosphorescence screen, those are the dots here, and then notice that over time those dots form uh, what's obviously an interference pattern associated with the wave function of the center of mass of this big crazy object. And if all this field did was, you know, year after year, push this to bigger and bigger objects, I think that would be a legitimate scientific pursuit. At the same time, um, mechanical devices are very sophisticated classical technology. Your cell phone is full of them, LIGO uses them. Um, and we know from history that if you can take a really mature technology like that and add some quantum functionality or quantum insight, usually you improve things. Lastly, the fact that we are talking about seriously quantum mechanics of objects that are maybe so massive that they produce their own gravitational field makes it uh, at least plausible to ask whether there are experiments that we could do that would give some hint of what a full theory of quantum gravity would look like. Obviously, all our experiments are extremely non-relativistic. They're nearly flat space time. Um, but nevertheless, they ask questions like, if I have a massive object that sources some perfectly reasonable gravitational field, and then I put it in a superposition of places, well, then the space-time metric naively would have to be in some kind of superposition as well, but this is not something we have a theory for yet. Um, so it's, I'm not an expert in this kind of physics, but I know that it attracts attention from a, a real community of theorists, and in the long term, it certainly motivates some of our scientific interests. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, quantum optomechanics is sort of a specific way of studying macroscopic quantum physics. And it's even though not all devices look like this, it's useful starting with this as kind of a rubric uh, cartoon schematic. Uh, the basic idea is that light is something that we can really prepare pretty well quantum states of. So we prepare such a quantum state of light. Um, and then we let it interact unitarily. And this is key. We let it interact in a reversible way with some macroscopic degree of freedom. Now, light can interact irreversibly with macroscopic objects all the time. If you go out and get a sun, sunburn, okay, that's what's happened. But radiation pressure is pretty generically unitary. Um, so uh, the idea is that light bounces off some macroscopic object. In practice, you almost always need a cavity to amplify that bounce. Uh, and at the end of the day, one doesn't usually go and look at the macroscopic object itself, though sometimes you can. Usually what one does is to collect that light that's leaking back out and do some nice measurement on it. And from those measurements, try to infer whether there's something interesting, something quantum mechanical going on with the macroscopic degree of freedom. 
So that's the sort of cartoon picture of quantum optimal mechanics. Now I said we'd like to infer that there was something quantum mechanical going on with this macroscopic object. What does that really mean? Like there's no you know, single unique definition for what is quantum and what isn't quantum. Uh, the, uh, there are loose definitions. And I think maybe one of the best ways to approach this uh, jargon, this nomenclature, is to think about quantum effects in a sort of hierarchy. I mean, they're, they're phenomena which we can describe entirely with classical mechanics. Um, but then there are phenomena that require us to give up more and more and more of classical mechanics, or they require us to bring in more and more of the apparatus of quantum mechanics. And this is just meant to illustrate that in the case of a harmonic oscillator. So suppose that I have a harmonic oscillator and I can prepare it in its ground state and then measure its position or its momentum. And I do that over and over again, sometimes measuring its position, sometimes measuring its momentum. I will, my momentum results will give me a histogram that look like this. My position measurements will give me a histogram that look like this. And I can interpret that as being the marginals of a probability distribution for a a priori, a pre-measurement simultaneous value of X and P that's given by this Gaussian blob here. So this is a probability density in the phase space X and P. And even though the ground state, you know, that sounds like quantum mechanics, um, it's completely describable in terms of a classical probability distribution over X and P, okay? Now the size of these distributions, the width depends on H bar. Okay? But other than that, there's no qualitative feature that just says quantum mechanics. It's just a numerical feature. Um, not only is this a perfectly legitimate probability distribution, it is the probability distribution that plain old equilibrium classical stat met would predict for the oscillator at such and such a temperature. Okay. So that's in contrast. So the width of these guys being H bar, that's, you know, quantum mechanics, but it's not that much quantum mechanics in some sense. Um, the next step that we might consider is, well, let me just go from the ground states to the first excited state of my harmonic oscillator. So I prepare that, I measure its momentum, repeat, 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 prepare it, measure its uh, position over and over again, and I get these two perfectly reasonable looking histograms. The point though is that if I ask, well, what's the underlying joint probability distribution that would give rise to these marginal distributions? Here it is, it's a perfectly fine function, but it has to be negative somewhere. And that means it's not a probability in any usual sense. There's, you know, it doesn't make sense to say that the probability of having a certain X and P is negative something, okay? Um, so this is inconsistent with any uh, joint probability, a priori probability distribution. Um, and there are various ways of sort of teasing which aspects of quantum mechanics this hinges on. One natural way to see this is that this is a real consequence of the non-commutivity of X and P. Okay, those are not real numbers. They don't take real number values at the same time. Um, maybe another level in this hierarchy uh, would be what I would call bell type inequality, which is essentially this kind of measurement where you uh, measure one thing, you measure another thing, you ask about their joint probability distribution, you find that there is no such thing, except now, instead of being the two canonically conjugate variables of a single object, these are maybe the position of one object and the position of some other object that's arbitrarily far away and maybe space-like separated. So now the fact that they don't have a joint probability distribution really tells you something about uh, the impossibility of embedding a, a multi-body wave function in three-dimensional space. That's really giving up a lot of classical mechanics. And this is not meant to be exhaustive or authoritative. If you feel these should be reshuffled, if you feel there's a special place for squeeze states or p-function negativity, legged garg inequalities, all the other sort of interesting phenomena of quantum foundations. I would love to have that conversation and talk about where they might lie. Uh, but this is, uh, I guess what I should say is an awful lot of quantum optimal mechanics to date has been done in this regime. Uh, the field is now starting to work uh, sort of in these regimes. And what I'll tell you about is an effort to do some of that ourselves. Okay, in general, what we need for this is a good cavity. Here's the cavity. We need a good mechanical oscillator we need them to couple together pretty strongly. We want to minimize thermal fluctuations. Um, and we need some form of nonlinearity because um, a system of linear oscillators is frustratingly prone to end up in states like this. Okay, so I'll say more about that later, but that's something to keep in mind. 
Andreas, do we have any questions? This is sort of a natural pausing point because that's the introduction and background. Um, I have not seen any so far. Okay. Did I miss any? Don't think so, not in this chat at least or not. Uh, if you do, then raise your hand, please, now. Well, I'll keep going. I, so this yeah. is, um, okay. I'll yeah, please. So sorry, no. Okay, okay so um, in the past, we've done some experiments using uh, this membrane in the middle geometry. We were measuring this sort of drumhead type motion of this 100 nanogram silicon nitride membrane. And we were monitoring its position with heterodyne. And what that meant is that we would record the heterodyne signal for a long time, hours and days. And it looked like this more or less. And if you were to zoom in, it still looked just like noise. And if you took that day's worth of data and average it together, Fourier transform it, there'd be some little bump on it. And you could point to that bump and you would say, ah, yes, you know, that is some effect that's on the single phonon scale. That's one of these H bar scale uh, fluctuations in the left of my last graph. Um, and that's a certain kind of quantum mechanics. But you, know, you can look at this data all you want and you will never see a quantum jump. You will never be able to say, ah, right here, a phonon came in and another phonon went out. There's none of that in this kind of data. Um, but what we would like to get to is devices in which you can do something like that. And in our lab, the way we've realized that is in collaboration with Jacob Reichel's group, we build um, fabry perot cavities in which uh, that are in some sense totally standard, but in other senses, they're really special. The mirrors are formed on the end faces of optical fibers. The optical fibers are aligned pointing to each other in a ferrule. Um, and they can find a standing wave of light. You could work in principle at any wavelength. We work at telecom frequencies just for simplicity and eventual relevance, I would say. So this is just an optical cavity. Um, finesse of these devices might be 100,000 or so. For the mechanics, what we do is we fill it with superfluid helium. Okay, just as a cavity, there's no mechanics. It's just an optical cavity. The reason that we fill it with superfluid helium is we're going to use the sound waves in the helium as our mechanical modes. Um, and uh, before I describe those modes, I guess I'll tell you why we like superfluid helium so much. If you had to build an optomechanical device from scratch and you just went through the list of every conceivable mirror uh, material, liquid helium would be extremely appealing. It has a 19 electron volt band gap. That's the largest of any condensed material. Maybe more importantly, it just has zero chemical impurities. There's no way a non-helium atom can sit in superfluid. It just falls because there's no viscosity. And then it sticks to the wall. Superfluid also can't have any cracks or defects or vacancies. It's a liquid. There's just no such thing. So as a result, there are no mid-gap states in this giant band gap. It literally cannot absorb the kinds of photons we work with. Because of the superfluid state, it has no viscosity. And so in combination with all this purity, uh, it means very low mechanical loss in principle. You have to get very cold before that really sets in. Um, it's got great thermal conductivity at low temperatures. So it will actually, you can bolt it to a dilution refrigerator and it will actually get that cold. Um, this particular design we've come up with um, has a really nice feature, which means that the acoustic oscillator that we're gonna end up with is naturally perfectly overlapped with the optical oscillator. Um, I think I'll show a slide about that in a minute, but just to be clear, these mirrors here that are confining the optical mode also confine an acoustic mode, the exact same wave equation. And so there's going to be density waves that look just like the optical intensity waves. So bang, you've got some curved mirrors, you've locked them in place. Whatever optical cavity forms, it forms an acoustic cavity with the exact same profile. Uh, lastly, helium can host some really interesting hybrid quantum systems. Uh, things like electron bubbles. Maybe I'll say a little bit about that at the end of my talk. So to see where optomechanical coupling comes from, let me draw you a cartoon here of the optical intensity of one mode. And then this is the density of one helium sound wave. I could have picked any helium sound wave with 20 nodes or 100 nodes or one node, but I picked this one. Um, and the coupling comes about because photons spend most of their time here, say, and the amount of liquid helium that they overlap with is oscillating. Now they overlap with dense helium. Now they overlap with rarefied helium. And that changes the helium's index of refraction. Nothing fancy, just more density, higher index of refraction. And that effectively detunes the cavity. The cavity doesn't get physically longer and shorter, 
but its optical path length oscillates. Um, so that's a pretty standard form of, of coupling. One thing that's really nice about this geometry is that if you pick an optical mode like this one, it couples to one and only one acoustic mode. So this is the only acoustic standing wave this optical standing wave will couple to. And I have a cartoon uh, showing that here. This is just a whole bunch of copies of cavities all with the same optical mode. And then this is every single different acoustic mode, the lowest, the next lowest, the next lowest, et cetera, et cetera. And you can just see that if I do an overlap integral of optical intensity with density, that's zero just by symmetry, actually by the orthogonality of these mode functions. Zero overlap integral, zero overlap integral, zero overlap integral. Here, maximal overlap integral, zero, zero, zero again. And it's the same story if I look in the transverse plane. So just to say this again, each optical mode couples to one and only one acoustic mode. And that is a huge win for a lot of just sort of practical nitty gritty issues because in pretty much all optomechanical experiments uh, that I know of, um, one always has a you know, cantilever mode that one really likes and then sort of all the other cantilever modes that one does not like so much. And then, you know, you see this in data and I call this the forest of unwanted modes. There's some mode that's really interesting but your optical cavity transduces tens, hundreds, thousands of other modes. And uh, I should say I'm taking uh, figures from papers that I really highly regard. These are fantastic experiments. Uh, and our, our own experiments deal with this also. Everybody does, just sort of a fact of life. There's all these sort of junky, unwanted modes that get transduced. And we do the physics anyway. We find ways of ignoring those modes. But it would just be nicer if they were gone from the start. Um, and that's what this device that I'm describing to you today just gives you for free. Is there any, is there, sorry, um, uh, is there any nonlinear effects you would have to worry about uh, in li liquid helium? Um, not really. Couple back in a certain sense? What did you say? Which would then couple back. So, you know, you, you, here you looked at the, the linear modes, right, of uh, yeah. density modes and the, and the optical modes. And yes, there, there's only this one overlap. Mm -hmm. Could one not imagine that there would be higher order um, um, effects in the helium, which would scatter, you know? Yes. Um, so if I go to higher order, which here would be like saying that the density is not just proportional to pressure, um, then yes, you do a kind of different type of overlap integral, and these are not all guaranteed to be zero, but that's insanely weak. We're always talking about density fluctuations that are practically in their ground state. I mean, zero, one, two, three phonons at this point. So yeah, at nonlinear levels, you'd have to worry about these other modes, but everything we do is really hard in the linear mode. We have just, I mean, we, we put this to the test. We would like drive, uh, we'd use this kind of optical mode and drive this acoustic mode as hard as we could, and we just cannot see it. While we can sense this mode at the single phonon level. Thank you. So this is really, uh, I sometimes call this the monogamy of optomechanical coupling in these devices in analogy with the monogamy of entanglement. Um, and it's really robust. It's really, you know, you, you shine your laser, it only picks up one acoustic mode. And that's a consequence of this really elegant, simple geometry. The optical cavity, just fabry Perot clamped boundary conditions. The acoustics, fabry Perot clamped boundary conditions, totally homogeneous medium in between. Um, okay, so um, those are some nice features. The last one, which is also just like a huge win, is that the way we build these devices, they require no in-situ alignment. When we get these fibers from Jacob's group, we align them in a ferrule, we have a couple tricks, you spin them with respect to each other at room temperature, but once you're happy, you epoxy them in place, uh, you epoxy these ferrules into a little box, here's three pairs, so this is one device, another device, another device, they go in a little box. Each one has an optical fiber that runs out. This box gets bolted up. Fibers run out. There's one fill tube for liquid helium, and that's it. There's no addo cubes. The input coupling to the cavity is guaranteed by light coming down the fiber, getting into the cavity. The overlap between the optical mode and the acoustic mode is guaranteed because that's just your mirror shapes, as I mentioned before. So there's just no uh, I mean, I love addo cubes. They have saved my career in other experiments, but it's nice to have uh, an experiment that does not require them. And it means that we can really think about scaling these devices up in a big way. I mean, there would be no problem putting a hundred of these, maybe a thousand of them in a dilution refrigerator. Um, and that will be relevant for some of the next plants that I'll talk about later. Uh, 
they survive thermal cycling, room temperature up and down, they're still aligned. Anyway, a lot of nice things about these devices. Okay, and then the, but the thing we're really after, the physics, is that instead of recording heterodyne data, which is really just noise and a tiny bit of quantum mechanics buried in there, we're going to use single photo detectors um, to detect the individual photons that are created when exactly one phonon is annihilated or added to the acoustic mode. And so our data looks like this. This is real data. The blue is sort of a triggering sequence, but the red spikes are the single photon counts from a commercial uh, SNSPD. And this is data taken over a second. When we zoom in, um, the analog signal coming out of our single photon detector is a spike that we can localize in time to better than a nanosecond. It has signal to noise ratio of sort of in infinity. I mean, there's never any uh, question about what has happened down there. And as long as we can guarantee that this photon really was associated with inelastically producing a phonon, each one of these giant spikes really tells us something about the quantum state of the acoustic mode in the cavity. Okay, what it tells us precisely, I'll have more to say about it in a minute. So in order to see what such a click tells us, let me draw this picture for you. This is a canonical optomechanics uh, device. We have green light coming in. Uh, some of that light gets unshifted, comes back elastically as green light, but some, uh, that light might absorb a phonon from this oscillator and come back blue shifted, or it might deposit a phonon in this oscillator and come back red shifted. And if your detector doesn't tell you which photon gave you the click, there's not much you can do about that. But if your detector really says, hey, that was a red photon click, that tells you something. That tells you that exactly one phonon has been added to the mechanical oscillator. Okay, and that's useful knowledge uh, about the mechanical oscillator's quantum state. In practice, that's hard because most of the phonon, photons come back unshifted and your detector is swamped. Uh, but it was pointed out by uh, various people that uh, one nice way of doing that would just be to put a really good filter here and just block all these unwanted photons and only pass the wanted ones. And in our lab, we use a couple of cascaded commercial Fabry Pro cavities. We get 100 dB rejection of the unwanted beams Total transmission is not as high as we would like, but it's high enough to work with. About 10% of the wanted photons come through. And a little more schematically, the experiment looks like this. We have one laser that sits always blue detuned from the resonance, cavity resonance, one that's always red detuned from the cavity resonance. We can pick which one we send to the device. That light goes in, maybe acquires some sideband photons, come back out through a circulator, and then the filter is set to only pass the sideband photons which are then detected by some superconducting nanowire detectors that live back inside the fridge. And so if we record the rate at which we're getting clicks on these detectors, as we sweep the laser's frequency, we see data that looks like this. Um, and I should say that we know that the acoustic mode that the laser couples to in that optomechanical coupling story I was telling you about is a 315 megahertz mode. But nevertheless, we do various characterizations. We can figure out how many of these counts are the dark ones? How many come from different kinds of leakage paths? Um, there's a feature associated with uh, guided acoustic wave brew and scattering in the fibers. We sort of understand all this. Um, and then this remaining peak at the expected frequency is the motional sidebands, the optomechanically generated photons. If we retake this data with the red detuned laser, so uh, take it at negative detunings, but just flip the data over so they sit on top of each other, it looks like this. It looks like the red data here. So the same backgrounds, we understand them quite well, but the optomechanical signal uh, is different. And this difference here is what's known as the quantum sideband asymmetry. Uh, you don't have to believe at me that this is uh, the origin of this difference in the data, but we do a, a ton of systematic checks uh, to verify that that is in fact the origin of this difference here. And I'll show you some of those checks now actually. So what I'm gonna show you is uh, data where we're going to just park the laser at this frequency, measure the rate at which we get counts from the red or from the blue, and then occasionally switch the laser over to 310 megahertz, record what we would call just the rate of background photons, and subtract that off of our data. And when we do that, and let's say vary the refrigerator temperature, this is the rate of signal photons that we see, or rather signal minus background, when we drive it on the blue side or when we drive it on the red side. The solid lines are uh, fit, where the only free parameter is the overall vertical scaling of the data. 
And this persistent difference between the red sideband and the blue sideband is this quantum sideband asymmetry that you can see in sort of one data set over here. Um, we have to take this, in order to get the device pretty cold, we have to take this uh, sending in relatively little laser power, so a quarter of a nanowatt. Um, it's interesting to see what happens when we crank up the laser power. So this is with the fridge at its base temperature, which we pretend is 20 millikelvin. We don't really know exactly what it is. And we just start cranking up the laser power and seeing what happens. And this is now the sideband count rate divided by power. So uh, to compensate for the fact that we're taking data at different powers. And the solid line here is a simple fit to basic optomechanics theory, which includes two features. One is the quantum sideband asymmetry. The other is the dynamical back action. When we take the blue data, we're driving the cavity on the blue side. So we anti-damp the mode, uh, but this is very well understood. When we drive it on the red side, we damp it a bit. So that's sort of this uh, shaded area is that contribution. And then as you crank up the laser power, the device gets hotter. There's some light is absorbed in the mirrors, not in the helium, uh, but it does get hotter. And so uh, we've also folded in a temperature dependence on power that's just derived from the well-known thermal transport properties of liquid helium. So we get a very nice fit here. We have a zero power data point, which is taken by leaving the power off for a while and then just turning it on for a quick pulse, leaving it off, turning it on for a quick pulse. I'll say more about that later, but it really does give us access to effectively the unperturbed system, or at least the unheated system. And what you can see is that uh, with low laser power anyway, there's uh, the fridge cools the acoustic mode to a mean phonon number of about one. Uh, but nearly all of this data could be gotten by heterodyne measurements. I mean, the single photon detectors give us some wonderful signal to noise ratio, but like, there's not really any new physics here uh, beyond what you could do with heterodyne data. But in our record coming out of the single photon detector isn't just this like blur of noise, it's real arrival times of every single photon. That's a huge treasure trove of information. So in order to take advantage of that treasure trove of information in the photon arrival times, we'll start to look at the statistics. And the first thing that we look at is the two photon correlations of these sideband photons. So given that a photon has arrived at a certain time, how many photons am I getting after such and such a delay? Um, and this is just the raw coincidence data. We know that some of our photons come from uh, coherent light that's leaking through our device somehow. We characterize that light and subtract it off. And that leaves us with a sort of corrected coincidence rate that looks like this. We fit that uh, to the expected form of just a constant plus a decaying exponential. It's a very good fit. We use this fit to normalize the data and convert this into G2, uh, the usual two photon correlation function. Um, and indeed, it has what you'd expect for a thermal state. Now, I should say, when we take our laser and put it straight on the photo detector, it's a totally flat G1. What's happening here is that we're looking at photons that are produced from that coherent laser light and some thermal phonon. And so that uh, means that the sideband light inherits the thermal characteristic of its source, so to speak, the thermally fluctuating acoustic mode. And you can see that here. Um, we can take this data at a bunch of different laser powers. And so this is a bunch of different laser powers. These are the corresponding fits. And you can see there is some difference here. Um, but what that is, is change in the decay rate of this uh, single exponential decay. That decay rate is supposed to be the mechanical damping rate. Uh, but this depends on power just because of dynamical back action. If you like, we are applying a blue detuned laser and that makes the gamma M get smaller. If we do the same thing on the red side, we see the gamma mechanical get larger. Um, so the summary of those fits is plotted here. So this is as a function of drive power for red detuned and blue detuned light. What is the value of G2 at uh, zero delay? It's very close to two in agreement with theory. And then what is the value of the damping rate extracted from this exponential decay? And it depends on laser power, just as you'd expect from standard classical optomechanical dynamical back action theory. And the specific way it depends on it gives us a nice measure of the optomechanical coupling rate, which is about four or five kilohertz. That agrees with a bunch of other measurements we've done. Um, <clears throat> just to show you what the G2 at the origin really is in our data, this is a zoom in. It's, it's pretty close to two. Okay. 
well, we have a lot of data. We don't have to stop at two photon correlations. We can also calculate three photon correlations. So given that a photon arrives, what's the chance that a second photon arrives 200 microseconds later and a third photon arrives 100 microseconds after that? Okay, that's a well-defined thing. We can extract it from our data. Here it is. Again, we correct it for the little bits of uh, coherent stray light that's in there and work with that corrected data. And we fit that to a function that's very much like the theoretical expectation. This is the residuals of that fit. It's a little hard to see in this kind of a plot here. Um, and then we use that fit to normalize the raw coincidence data to give us G3. Um, so here's G3. Here's the fit residuals now converted into errors in G3. And so what this tells us uh, is, <laughs> loosely speaking, if you get one photon arrive and then another photon arrives right after it, the chances of getting a third photon right after that is six times higher than the average photon rate. Okay. That's just sort of interesting, I guess. We can push this further. We can, go, oh, sorry. And then here's those uh, three point correlation functions again as a function of laser power, fits uh, data and fits and residuals. Um, the value of this uh, uh, three point correlation function at the origin, it's always pretty close to six. The observed decay rate looks consistent with optical damping and anti-damping gives us a value of G naught that's consistent with the other data. We can go further, we can go to G4. So G4 says, hey, if one photon arrives, what's the chances that my next photon is at a certain time, my second photon is at a, my third photon is at such and such a time, my fourth photon is at such and such a time. That's a three dimensional data cube. There are three different delays. We've taken that entire data cube just for convenience, this is one slice through it. Um, and it shows you that if you have just gotten three photons, your chance of getting a fourth photon is 24 times higher uh, than the average rate. Um, so uh, what would I say about all of this? We could, in principle, keep going to the fifth order and so on. Uh, what, are we, what are we getting out of this? First of all, we're not getting any quantum mechanics so far. This agreement with the theoretical prediction for a thermal state is nice, tells us we're really in a thermal state, but it tells us nothing about quantum mechanics. There's no H bar in these expressions. These expressions don't even care about your mean phonon number. If the acoustic mode was at a mean phonon number of 0.01, or if it was at room temperature, these correlation functions would look exactly the same. Okay, so that's a little bit frustrating given that we're counting photons and uh, looking at higher order correlations, but nope, it's all classical. That's really a consequence of the thermal state. So in some sense, what you can say is we have really characterized the heck out of our oscillator, and we have confirmed that it is being driven by a bath that is not just white noise, it's not just a Gaussian distributed Langevin function, we've sort of characterized the skew and the kurtosis of the thermal fluctuations of the bath that's driving our modes and found that they're consistent with thermal. Um, this isn't totally wasted time because in principle, you can really reconstruct a uh, Wigner function from sufficient uh, measurements of these higher and higher order photon uh, correlations, G2, G3, G4, G5, um, though it's not always practical. There's sort of a formal relation between them. Um, the thing that I think we're most interested in is that these measurements um, the back action of these measurements tend to produce states that are not thermal. So somehow buried in here in the conditional measurements uh, in this data um, uh, are measurements of states that are not thermal. Um, and so the uh, basic story there is the one that I told at the beginning of this photon counting section, which is that when you get a click at your detector, you have definitely taken whatever your state was before of your mechanics and added exactly one phonon to it. And often, uh, depending on the state you were starting with, that's a much more interesting quantum state, a state that might have Wigner function negativity or other interesting uh, properties. But it turns out that we can't detect any of those interesting properties by doing these experiments, by just parking a laser red detuned, collecting the photons that come off in a continuous wave kind of experiment and then analyzing them. And that data doesn't contain any of that interesting physics that we're after. In practice, what we need to do is what's been done very nicely, for example, by the Delft and Vienna groups and the group at Caltech, which is to uh, start with a laser driving on one side, get some clicks, then immediately drive it on the other side, 
and look at the G2, G3 correlation functions across uh, red detuning and blue detunings. So what uh, we would like to get to is a place where we're, again, copying uh, some of the work uh, by our colleagues in other places, where as a function of time, you send in blue detuned pulse, maybe you get some clicks. Uh, in a short period of time afterwards, you send in some red detuned pulse, maybe you get some clicks. And then you look at the correlations between these pulses, let the system settle again, you do it again, do it again. And in this way, you can start to test things like Cauchy-Schwartz inequalities or Bell inequalities in an interesting way. So we're just getting started with that kind of approach. Um, but just to show you how this works, uh, here's measurements where we keep track of the sideband photon rate as a function of time while we just turn on a laser for 25 microseconds. So what you can see is we get a lot of clicks, uh, and then we switch it off, and it goes back to, uh, to no clicks, of course. Um, the really nice thing about this uh, is that if we now repeat some of the measurements I was telling you about and just measure this rate of clicks under pulsed excitation as a function of fridge temperature, well, again, it agrees very well with theory. Isn't that just the same as the CW measurement? No, here the device is getting a lot colder. Uh, so if I just sort of extrapolate these points back onto the line, they're getting almost a factor of two colder than we can get with any you know, real usable CW kind of measurement. This data is the sort of zero power data point that I showed you before. Maybe more exciting uh, is what happens as a function of laser power. So when we just drive the uh, device continuously, more and more laser power makes the device heat up. It gets laser damped, laser anti-damped. But when we do it with, uh, in this case, I think this is five microsecond pulses, no matter how much laser power we put in, we don't see any heating in the acoustic mode. More specifically, what I would say is you turn on the laser, and for the first five microseconds, we get plenty of counts, enough to make a good measurement, but whatever heating is going on hasn't had time to actually heat up the mechanical device. Once you switch off the laser, you have to wait for a couple hundred microseconds for it to settle back down, um, but that's a win for a lot of experiments. Okay, so this is promising for pulse measurements. Uh, that we're doing with our devices right now and learning how to do this better. Um, Andreas, uh, can I ask you how we're doing for time? Uh, I think we, as far as I, it, I, I know, we are doing perfectly uh, so far. <laughs> so um, uh, I don't know how much more material you have, but uh, uh, it's sort of two slides, but I could spend more or less time on them. What are we? Yeah, I, th I think I was given the directive that's like forty-five minutes a good time scale, but fifty would be fine too. So okay. I think it's good. And so when did we start? Uh, quarter past, so quarter we have past. another five okay. minutes roughly. Okay, that should be fine. Okay, so the pulsed measurements and then looking at correlations across red and blue driving and kind of uh, um, doing something similar to what's already been in the experimental literature is what we're working on now. At the same time, we're building the new generation of these fiber cavity devices to take care of two really outstanding technical issues. The first is that our acoustic modes really have unimpressive quality factors, 10 to the five. Uh, despite the fact that helium has these wonderful properties. But the phonons, uh, if you like, bounce around inside the helium, but eventually they can overcome the acoustic impedance mismatch and just leak out into the glass fiber and they're gone. Okay? So we have two approaches for fixing that problem. One is we now have mirrors that feature uh, DBR coatings that are high reflectivity for the light, but also have another band of DBR coatings that are high reflectivity for the phonons. And we expect that that will allow us, although we have to work with bigger cavities, we expect that this will allow us to improve the quality factor by at least a couple orders of magnitude. Um, the other thing that we're very interested in is um, taking advantage of the fact that the speed of sound in liquid helium is much less than the speed of sound in anything else. So basically with liquid helium, you almost always get total internal reflection. So we're now building ring cavities where the mirrors are conventional optical mirrors, because uh, you don't get total internal reflection for light. You really need good mirrors there. But in the ring cavity, sound waves aren't at normal incidence, and so they will undergo total internal reflection, these very smooth surfaces. And we expect that this will give us acoustic modes with quality factors up to about 10 to the 8. So that would be two or three orders of magnitude improvement on what we have. And this would extend the phonon lifetime from sort of 100 microsecond out to the second time scale. Uh, the improvement in the queue and also the fact that these cavities will be a little bit longer. 
And that would open up a lot of doors. That would mean you get a click heralding a phone on, and you now have a second to do something with that system. That's plenty of time to close the loop uh, for various kinds of uh, drives that can be applied to the system, conditions on what kinds of clicks you get. This is a route to making some more interesting quantum mechanical states and doing some interesting quantum control. Uh, but really just having second uh, lifetime acoustic quanta would be, would be really nice. The other thing these high Q factors would allow us to do is to laser cool the acoustic mode from the fridge temperature down to really the ground state. At this point, the low Q means we just kind of have to live with whatever temperature the fridge provides us. The other thing that we're really interested in is taking advantage of this elegant simplicity of the fabry perot geometry um, here to realize indistinguishable cavities uh, for generating entanglement across large arrays of devices and implementing things like the DLCZ protocol. So here the basic idea is if you take one of our fiber cavities and you put it on a piezo, you put one mirror on a piezo, we haven't done that yet, but that's a pretty standard thing to do. And then you build another one, you put one of its mirrors on a piezo, build a whole bunch of these, cool them down, they're all going to be different lengths. Okay, that's just sort of unavoidable. But so long as you can use the PZT to tune each cavity into resonance with a single laser, that's not very demanding, that requires a quarter wavelength of travel in each piezo, um, then all of these cavities are more or less optically indistinguishable. A photon that comes out of the laser is just as likely to get into any of these. And because of this monogamy of optomechanical coupling that I was referring to, um, if they all couple to light at 1550 nanometers, they all, uh, that light couples to the acoustic modes with 775 nanometer wavelength. So every single one of these cavities will emit sideband photons at exactly the same frequency. So sideband photons come up, we imagine they go through the same kind of filtering scheme and hit a single photon detector, at which point a click there doesn't say, hey, there's one phonon added to this mode. It says there's one phonon distributed over this entire array, uh, which generates what's called a W state, which is useful for things like L test. Um, so this is a very well-known kind of protocol. My only claim is that the construction of these devices gives a really nice way to ensure practical indistinguishability in the frequency, timing, polarization, and spatial modes. Uh, and doing that, has been a huge roadblock to implementing the elegant ideas uh, from DLCC and for using these kinds of systems in real life networks. I would say it's a, definitely a plus that we're already working with telecom photons, devices that are coupled to single mode fibers and devices where the local state, the acoustic mode, we hope will have lifetimes on the order of a second. So our hope is that we can really make a big contribution to quantum networking technology in this next generation of devices. Um, so that's it for my talk. This is just a quick conclusion slide. We have these nice superfluid filled cavities. They couple nicely to acoustic modes in the cavity. We can detect the individual sideband photons. We've characterized them very thoroughly. What we're characterizing at present is thermal states, but uh, at least it's making sense uh, up to the fourth order correlations. Um, we have plans for extending uh, phonon lifetimes out to a second to entangling lots of devices, maybe, I mean, hundreds, thousands, separated by tens of kilometers of optical fibers. That's sort of the ambitious goal, but that's the goal. Um, these systems can host some really interesting hybrid quantum systems. One thing that we're interested in doing is trapping electron bubbles in these cavities. Um, electron bubbles have some really interesting properties, but one of them is that their spin coherence time is expected to be astronomical. Uh, so they might provide an interesting kind of qubit, Trapping an array of electron bubbles might make an interesting analog with trapped ion chains. Um, in any case, it would be a really interesting system to study. In my group, we have two other projects going on. One is using uh, magnetic levitation at much larger volumes of liquid helium, millimeter scale drops levitated in vacuum. Uh, we want to study this as a new kind of optomechanical system. So far, we've measured their uh, mechanical properties, the drops oscillation frequencies, they agree very nicely with theory, and we're working on pushing this experiment into new regimes with a, a new generation device. Um, lastly, we have some experiments on uh, topological dynamics and what are called exceptional points in non-Hermitian systems. And recently what we've shown is that if you take three oscillators, in this case they're mechanical modes, and you tune them so that their modes are triply degenerate, um, then 
what we have measured is that generically, as you go away from that triple degeneracy in all the possible ways, what you will find is a, a set of parameter tunings at which you still have a double degeneracy. And the space of double degeneracies that surrounds the triple degeneracy is a knot. In this case, it's a trefoil knot. And we've also shown that when you imagine encircling one of these loops, or when you actually encircle one of these loops, what your three normal mode frequencies do in the complex plane is they execute a braid. And the braid depends upon how the loop encloses this knot in some really elegant topology. Um, so we're getting ready to write this up, but there's a lot of next steps with this project as well. I should say we have postdoc positions available, possibly on all of these projects, but certainly postdoc positions available. So if that's of interest to you, feel free to uh, contact me. And lastly, thank you. Uh, thanks to the grad students, especially postdoc Yogesh Patil, who's worked on this, and our funding sponsors and our collaborator, Jacob Reichel. And thanks for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Jack. Um, so, um, how should we proceed? Let's see whether there's any direct questions. Oh, there's one coming in. Oh, let's see how. Um, this is uh, Ignacio. Sorry. Oh, I, I tried to unmute you, Ignacio, but it's somehow. Uh, ah, there we go. So now, 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 now you can hear me? Yeah. Yes. yeah. Okay. So, hello. Thank hey, you. Ignacio. Hi, Jack. I was wondering, it's a simple question. You, you, you showed the, su the two strategies to improve the, the mechanical quality factor. Mm -hmm. So, if the superfluid helium is so good, wouldn't it be the case that in the um, internal, total internal reflection situation, like maybe the Q is still limited by, by actually scat scatter of phonons and things like that. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you consider rather doing the, the, the ring thing also with the acoustic DVRs, if you have them? Yeah, so this 10 to the 8 estimate is based on uh, two things. One is um, scattering from the roughness of these mirrors. So from optical cavities that are made this way, we have an estimate of how rough the mirrors are. And the total internal reflection is spoiled by that roughness. So we know how to calculate that. And then liquid helium has its own internal loss from three phonon scattering that is has very, very well studied. Uh, it has a temperature to the fourth dependence. And at the temperatures we're likely to get to, maybe 20 millikelvin, um, that also sets a limit on how high this quality factor can be. And that's where we get this 10 to the eight number. And with those two loss mechanisms, having acoustic DBRs here wouldn't help. You're already being limited by the surface roughness. Uh, it's because it's interest. a 1D, a 1D gap, no, for the phonons. It, it's not really protecting you from, from the things that have been scattered. Yeah, it, it, it was stupid. Um, it's because the mode would still look like this. So if you had deep, nice acoustic DBRs in there, that would be great. The mode would look like this. There'd be a little bit of evanescent leakage into here, which your DBR would be solving. But at the physical surface, at the very layer, top layer here where the mode is fully populated, there is some roughness. And that spoils the total internal reflection. And so putting in some fancy DBR in there wouldn't help. You know, that the roughness here would be scattering light out into four pi, two pi. Um, and you cannot think of some 3D. Phonolic vanguard that you would do it is, that, that is incompatible with this type of thing. No, I mean three D uh, band gap would be great, but what I'm saying is like, you know, so you make you take you do your nice lithography and you get a great three D band gap material. What I'm saying is based on what we know about like the imperfections, lithographic and material imperfections at the surface, um, nothing that happens below there is going to make your reflections any better. Um, you know, if you have a certain amount of loss and then you put in a lot of low loss elements, it doesn't improve your loss, right? Loss is just add. Um, well, it depends if you scatter into foreign modes that are in the, um, in, the, in the thing that is getting blocked by the, by the gap. No? Yeah, that I think I was... will contribute the loss, no? but, but, but I understand that it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. 
All right. Um, and there's uh, Sogato. Hello, and, and very, very interesting talk on, on a number of fronts. Okay, thank you. So, so I have uh, two, two questions, maybe. So one is, uh, so as I understand with these, uh, these pictures, which are on the current slide, you're going to like one hertz for the, the, the gamma, the, the kappa, right? Yeah. Yeah, the mechanical gamma. Mechanical, yeah. yeah. So in, uh, so, and, and I saw that you like have 4.5 kilohertz for your single photon nonlinearity. Yes. Right. Uh, one thing which probably you did not um, write, so is the coupling still the same form, like this usual trilinear A dagger A X? Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So that will, that will, that is um, quite close to the regimes for then Schrodinger cats and stuff might get, um, unless, unless your light, what is your light leakage? That's, that's the problem. It's still 10 megahertz. Okay. Yeah. So this, um, none of these devices gets into qualitatively new regimes in terms of the hierarchy of kappa, g naught, and omega mechanical. They're all sort of good, right? Right. Uh, but not, you know, single quantum strong coupling. All of our interesting quantum mechanics goals have to do with the back action of the single photon detector. Right. And, and regarding this exclusiveness of coupling to one frequency that you were showing, mm -hmm. and of course you went up to some modes, but are there still other modes which couple or, or like? No, I mean, this is just the orthogonality of the normal modes of a, of a cavity. I mean, right. it's, it's literally that simple. Like uh, optomechanical coupling, I take the light intensity, mm -hmm. which is the square of a Hermite Gauss Right. Uh, polynomial in the transverse direction and sort of plane wave thing in this direction. Right. And I overlap that with the density wave, which is one Hermit Gauss polynomial. And you right. can just, I mean, this is just, uh, so the, the point, the thing that's really unusual about these devices is the optical modes and the acoustic modes are, are defined by exactly the same boundary conditions, exactly the same wave equation. Right. So once you do separation of variables and pull out the time, they have very different frequencies. But right. the spatial differential equation that determines their eigenmodes mm -hmm. are exactly the same. Right. And so you have this really right. nice orthogonality. Okay, I see. I see. And, and regarding the thing on your last slide, these uh, electron uh, chains, which I also found very interesting. Yes. So what is, I guess you're planning to put these under in these several cavities for linking up DL, CZ and, and ion Could trap. DLCZ, you don't need uh, uh, emitters in there. So DLCZ, the single emitter, is the sideband photon. Right. And then the memory is the phonon that lives in here. Ah, right. That's the memory. Right. right. So that's the DLCZ. There's no electron bubbles. It's really just you know five mm -hmm. copies of our device, maybe in five different dilution refrigerators, some right. technical improvements along the way. The electron bubble is really just like a whole nother thing. So mm -hmm. what we imagine is you could either use this optical standing wave or by driving an acoustic mode, a uh, pressured standing wave to trap an electron bubble. Mm -hmm. And it sits here. Mm -hmm. And if there's a field gradient around, it gets a little force depending on what its spin is. Mm -hmm. And because it represents a little hole in the helium, you can read out its position with the optical cavity pretty well. I mean, this is, I see. Uh, we're now doing levitated optomechanics, right? Right, right, right. Um, right. And so that's the, that's the thinking there. All right. And, and these are not directly exchange coupled. These are kind of more distant. Coulomb. Uh, yeah. Coulomb. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, there's one question from, from Michael Wanner. Michael Wanner is, is who, where are you? Uh, you're on here. I'm, I'm in the Zoom. Can, oh, can okay, everybody okay. hear me? Please, yeah, please go ahead. Hey, Michael. Great. So, hi, Jack. Fantastic talk. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, I had a question. Um, Sugato touched on it already in his question. I'm very interested in, uh, could you comment on what, what's the prospects of improving the optical line width and really pushing into the strong coupling regime? I uh, don't see any great routes to that. I mean, the, right now, our mm -hmm. cavities are sort of 100 microns long. Finesse is 100,000. Cavity line width is 20 megahertz. Um, mm -hmm. Where is resolve the side band? Because... You, if, you, if you make the cavity much longer to reduce the kappa, do you, do you take a hit elsewhere? In G0. Usually not. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, 
uh, and they scale a little bit differently. So maybe if like you built a hundred meter long cavity, uh, your kappa would be you know one hertz and your g naught would be two hertz. But <laughs> mm. in the in the kinds of things we're building, we don't see a route to making kappa smaller than g naught. Yeah, and and I I really like this picture of the the mechanical mode monogamy. Very nice. Uh, do you have uh, any other optical modes present that uh, could could be a, a path that hinders uh, your your single mechanical mode coupling? Um, there are definitely all the other optical modes are there, mm -hmm. um, but they're at two hundred terahertz. So if we don't drive them, I think we always just ignore them. Mm. Um, oh, I mean, could there be an accidental scattering from one mode into another mode? Oh. that has a different spatial structure, thus providing a, a, a channel to couple to a different spatial yeah, mechanical you, mode. You need momentum and energy conservation. So uh, it would be, mm. I'm not sure how this would happen. The cavity mode volume is pretty small. So the free spectral range is one and a half terahertz. So there just, there aren't that many cavity modes. And then right, I see. something would have to come along to give you just the right K and mm. delta mm. omega to do that. Uh, but it's an interesting point. There might be some interesting things you could do, like if you were to tune the cavity length to get the splitting between transverse modes to be comparable to the acoustic modes. You know, these kinds mm. of ideas have been talked about in lots of optomechanical systems. And there you might uh, reintroduce multi-mode optomechanics. Uh, mm. But for now, we're really enjoying having a truly single mode system. Absolutely. Great talk, Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Jack, there's one more question from the from the chat from Edward. Um, Edward, do you want to um, pose your question? Yes, yes, please. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. Thanks. Really interesting talk. Um, in fluid helium, of course, there's two types of sound. You have second sound as well. Do you see any evidence of that coupling to light in your system? No. So at these temperatures, there's no second sound. So once you're below. Uh, 300, 400 millikelvin. Mm -hmm. uh, the sort of there's not a uh, there's really only first sound. So the way my my picture of uh, this is that um, you know at zero temperature the helium is a pure superfluid, no excitations. Mm -hmm. You go up to temperature of epsilon, and then there are you know phonons. So you can look at the branch, you know the fundamental excitations in helium, phonons, maxons, rotons. You can excite a few phonons. They bounce around. Liquid helium has a pretty linear compressibility, pressure density relationship. So phonons mostly just pass right through each other. Uh, but it is a little bit incompressible. So there's a chance that both phonons can scatter. Um, it doesn't happen very much. But as you get hotter and there are more and more phonons bouncing around essentially ballistically, all what we call first sound, at some point they get so dense that this little bit of acoustic nonlinearity means a given phonon is more likely to bounce off of other phonons than it is off the wall. And at that point, your phonons become hydrodynamic. They become a fluid. And as a fluid, that fluid can support waves. And those are what uh, I would call second sound. Um, so if you take that sort of mechanical point of view, it's natural to see why once you're cold enough and there just aren't that many background phonons, um, you don't have second sound. Yeah. OK, thank you. You know, yeah, so all these experiments are done. You know, we try to keep everything at 50 millikelvin or well below. So there's no rotons, uh, there's no second sound. And there also, the way we fill our chamber, there are no remnant vortices. So the background helium is curl free. And uh, we really try to end up with as acoustically simple a, a system as we can. Good, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so from the chat, I don't see any more questions. So maybe they give me the chance just to ask you to whether you uh, want to add a little bit to the last point on your last slide about the uh, from personal interest uh, about topological dynamics and exceptional points. Um, yeah, can you you know add a few sentences? Uh, what yeah, you've been done there do, um, recently or planned to do there in that direction. Yeah, I mean, if you have a couple minutes, the story that I would tell is it's uh, thoroughly studied that if you have two mechanical oscillators uh, and you bring them to degeneracy, um, then 
uh, in, uh, so if you don't have some deep reason for believing that your system is from issue. So if you're doing quantum mechanics with closed systems, your system is from issue, that's axiomatic. But if you just have some collection of mechanical oscillators that might have a bit of damping, there might be a bit of non-reciprocal Lorentz type forces or who knows what, if that's your point of view, then generically when you uh, start to tune parameters to bring eigenvalues in the complex plane and make them equal to each other, um, the most natural, the most general such degeneracy is a non-Hermitian one. It's an exceptional point. And if you're sitting at an exceptional point of a two-mode system and you ask how many linearly independent ways can I break that degeneracy, there are two linearly independent ways to do it. Um, is there some good intuition for this? Um, yeah, loosely speaking, uh, if, you're, if you ignore the trace of your matrix, uh, a two by two uh, matrix has, if it's traceless, it only has one eigenvalue. You pick the eigenvalue, I know what the other one is, it's just minus mm -hmm. that. And if that eigenvalue is a complex number, because we're talking about non-Hermitian systems, well, you have two parts to that. So if I'm at an exceptional point, I have two linearly independent ways to break it. Um, and what is easy to show is that uh, the eigenvalues, as you go around that, have the topology of the square root function. So there are, two, there are always two eigenvalues when you go away from the, this degeneracy, but as you wrap around, one of those eigenvalues gets smoothly transformed into the other and vice versa. And again, this is just the Riemann sheets of the square root function. And why is it the square root function? Well, because you're diagonalizing a two by two matrix and it has the quadratic formula and that has the square root. That's the whole story. Um, so then people, us included, were wondering, well, what's the generalization when you have three modes? And there's a nice theory that was developed by Vladimir Arnold of KAM and Arnold tongues and tons of things. Um, and he showed that if you have three modes that are brought to the generic degeneracy, which is a triple exceptional point, there are four linearly independent ways of lifting the degeneracy. So you have sort of naturally a four dimensional space around EP3. Um, and then you could say, okay, that's fine. What happens if I encircle the EP3? Well, you can't. You can't encircle a point in a four-dimensional space. Mm. Encircling is an operation of co-dimension two. So you can't really encircle EP3 in any natural way. Um, but what you can show is that in the space around EP3, most of the ways that you break the degeneracy, there's no degeneracy left. But there is a subspace, a subset of points where there's still a double degeneracy. And there's a nice result in algebraic topology by John Milner, who's a fields medalist, that in general, the space of uh, doubly degenerate points away from a triply degenerate point is knotted. And in the particular case of just a triple degeneracy, or, uh, sorry, his result is that uh, if you have a high order degeneracy, the space of lower order degeneracies around it is knotted. And in, it's hard for me to picture uh, in any case except for three where that knot ends up being this trefoil knot here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if I have an exceptional point in EP3, around it is uh, a trefoil knot of double degeneracies. And that's something I can enclose um, because, uh, well, okay, the trefoil knot is one dimension. It has another sort of trivial dimension that extrudes this out into the four. So in this four dimensional space, it's a two dimensional surface, which has kind of one trivial dimension and then is knotted. Um, and that's something that I can talk about in circling. I can draw loops around that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that, uh, drawing loops around that will take my three eigenvalues and it will, uh, if I do a closed loop, I start with from some spectrum with three eigenvalues and I end up with the exact same spectrum with three eigenvalues. That's what's shown here. So this is the complex plane. This is also the complex plane. This is time. And these are my three eigenvalues initially. And as I do some loop that encloses a branch of this knot, these eigenvalues, as they go around that loop, come back to the same spectrum but they don't smoothly map to each other. They get swapped around. This is a cyclic permutation, I think, uh, but the actual trajectory of the eigenvalues is a braid. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, this is uh, potentially useful for things like topological control, but for now, mostly it's just sort of interesting and surprising that there's this really rich structure in pretty simple system. It is literally just three linear oscillators. Mm. 
And the extent to nonlinearities that uh, was referring to. So this is all true statements about linear systems, and uh, we are interested in what would happen. Uh, in, okay, so nonlinearity, that's a giant can of worms. There are a million things you could do, but specifically we're interested in, suppose that the system had some uh, saturable gain. So that once you rung up one mode, so suppose you put energy in this mode, it would stay self-sustained, mm -hmm. even though it's a non-Hermitian system and has damping and wants to decay. If it had saturable gain, it would reach some limit cycle and stay there. And we're wondering if that would allow us to do adiabatic transport along these braids. As it is, if you just have a linear system and you prepare your system in some state, the adiabatic theorem of Hermitian dynamics would say, hey, smooth, slowly vary and your excitation will stay in that smoothly connected eigen mode. But in, if your time evolution is non-Hermitian, there is no adiabatic theorem. It's much, has, it's much less general anyway. So we would like a way to kind of stabilize energy in a given mode, um, even though there's what's called gain loss imbalance that tends to break the usual adiabaticity. And our hope was that maybe there's a way to do that, that maybe some nice simple thing like saturable gain would provide a way to do that. Thank you. You're welcome. Let's see if there's any more comments or questions. I don't see that from the chat. Um, so I think that's possibly a good time to thank you. Uh, okay. or I can thank for, for everybody else, uh, you for, for the very nice talk. Okay, thank and you. Take your time. Uh, thank you guys very much. I and mean, this is a real pleasure and uh, best wishes for the, for the center and look forward to chatting with many of you in the future. And if I now ask the um, the host to, um, I don't know, Sophia or Mudasa to take over to either yeah. round it off. Yeah, no, that's, that's yeah. fine. Thank you um, everyone for joining us. And, and once again, of course, Jack for, for doing such an amazing presentation. Um, okay. uh, for everyone else, uh, we have our next talk next week. So we'll see you then. Um, so. Bye-bye. <laughs> just, just um, I'll just close uh, off. Yeah, yeah, go on, Sophia. Yeah, no, go on, go on, what I say. No, I'm just good. Please go. Okay, yeah, so, so we have one uh, quick uh, announcement for everyone is that we are looking for a volunteer to help us um, organize these seminars. Um, so we're primarily looking for a PhD student. Um, and if someone is interested, please send us an email. So we have our Gmail address for these um, seminars, which is unicorn.seminars at gmail.com. Um, That's a unicorn with a K. Um, so if anyone's interested, um, please get in touch. Thank you. Bye, right. everyone. Okay, yeah. Thank, thank you both for the 